This is the Serial and Midnight Podcast. Well, howdy and welcome to the Serial at Midnight Podcast. My name is Heath Holland, and this is uh, this episode is sort of a follow-up on some of the discussions we've been having here at Serial at Midnight for the last few weeks. Talking about, I made a video a couple of weeks ago for YouTube talking about some disturbing trends, basically some concerns I have about the future in entertainment, really the devaluation of movies and TV shows as content instead of art, instead of meaningful, you know, things that we love, like we connected these things, but the companies that are releasing these things view them as content. I'm concerned about AI pushing out more and more of the human element. There's just a lot of things that I'm kind of concerned about right now. And what the, the spark for it really was Disney deciding that they are going to take a few dozen of their streaming assets, their shows, their movies, and wipe them out of existence to write them off of their tax bill is what it comes down to. Uh, the Willow series, The World According to Jeff Goldblum. Uh, there's a movie with Brian Cranston called The Great and Terrible Ivan. And they had decided that those things had apparently ceased to be a draw. I don't know, but they were going to remove them from existence to lower their tax bill. So that means they can't, my understanding, they can't be sold to any other service. They can't be released on physical media. They're just gone now. And that scared me and I wanted to talk about it. And I heard from a lot of you guys who feel exactly the same way. I also heard from Stephen Lackey, my friend, independent filmmaker, uh, Stephen Lackey, who I've talked to here on the channel before, uh, at uh, Serial at Midnight, because he directed a documentary called Family of Fear which is a look inside the inner workings of a regional, like a regional spook house. One of these horror houses that pops up around the Halloween season every year. It's the Arx Mortis house. And he uh, went inside the, the, the location and really met the people that run it and the, the employees followed it through a season, got to know everybody and saw the family that has formed around this location. Uh, so, by the way, you should check that absolutely check that documentary out. I'm going to put links in the description of this so you can find it. I'll also put links to Steven's YouTube, his TikTok, his I mean, he's all over the place. And he wanted to give me the filmmaker perspective of these very real challenges because some people were like, you know, most, I think most people did agree with me. It was interesting because some people were like, ah, you don't need to worry about it. It's going to be fine. Here's the filmmaker perspective, guys. This conversation gets kicked off with him talking about walking out of meetings because they talked, they called his work content uh it's a fascinating conversation so i'm going to cut to it right now stephen lackey talking about so much of the things that we're concerned about right now Makes all right sense. so you're telling me wait a minute doc you're telling me that you've walked out of meetings when people say con when they refer to your work as content i have in and, and i think it probably it has i don't know i don't think it's hurt my career but it has definitely cost me money doing yeah. that and and it's you know i don't make documentary films for money because if i was in it for money i would do something different because you know you can count the number of documentary filmmakers on two hands that actually make money yeah. you know people want to say oh errol morris he won an oscar you know what errol morris works for pbs he does other stuff to actually make money so does jeff krulik another uh, filmmaker that I really love. So if it was, if I was doing this for money, then I would do something else. So I, but I have cost myself some money because there are distributors that are um, what I call brokers and they're in the, in the business of buying up movies so that they can package them in a big package and then sell them, sell that big package overseas. So your film gets no actual individual attention. They're selling, I can sell you 50 films, that kind of thing. And, and they, when I sit down in that meeting, it, this has happened more than once, and they start referring to it, oh, we're going to do this with the content and that with the content. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm no Picasso. I'm not. I'm just a little documentary filmmaker from Nashville, Tennessee. But I consider my my work an attempted art. It's, you know, it's all opinion. You could look at it and hate it. But movies are art. And, and I think you should treat them that way to some degree. You know, I, I don't expect the red carpet. I don't expect... Martin Scorsese treatment, but when you start just start calling it content and treating it like, you know, boxes of cereal on a shelf that you throw out when the expiration date has run out, that's not the kind of relationship I want to have. 
Let you me know? go down that road really quick because we do see this. You know, I talk about, I mean, I review so many movies, right? And mm-hmm. I do think movies are art. And what I have become increasingly frustrated with is that we are seeing movies as content and movies just as a product to push an IP. And look, you no, know, that's not new. That's not new at all. That's been it's around. Not. People love to go, oh, no, this is new. Orson Welles, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, I know, but it's never been as prolific and as profound and as like art the art of cinema has never been as reduced to a dollar sign and a viewing number as what we're seeing right now it has to do with streaming and it has to do with these studios spending like 300 million dollars on one movie and then hoping that it that they can push it over the hill i want your perspective on this because you are making it and you do think that movies are art if there's anybody out there who's like man that's pretentious like what would you say to them i would say do it invest your life into something and it and it is more than just investing money you know i, I do invest money i on 90 percent of my projects i go into debt myself i want i want whatever i put out it's on me so it, it, it there is money but i put my heart and soul into whatever i do you know when i sit down to do a documentary i know once i've committed to that project that's at least two years of my life that i am committing to something and then you're just gonna throw it on a shelf like a box of cereal like i said or 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 a, you know it, it's not elitist it's just showing some amount of respect for the work that was put into something, you know, and I, as somebody who's like you has been a film critic, I, I hate being negative about a film, but there's certain things that you can review in a movie that are good and bad. And it's because filmmaking is such a, uh, it's art by committee. And for me, there's really only two different t- kinds of art that are art by committee and it's film and music, you know, um, a good engineer can make or break a song. You know, so it's not just a singer that's responsible and, and a, a film is the same way. And because of that, movies can be bad, but you never take away from the art of it. You never take away from the passion of making that movie. You know, the lower budget, the movie, the the more passion was put in it because, you know, people are working for nothing or, you know, sometimes paying to work, right. <laughs> you know, so right. it's it, it may sound like elitism, but it is not meant that way. It's just trying to trying to remember that this is, is storytelling. It's at the core of what makes us human, mm-hmm. you know, telling stories. And when, when you don't treat it that way, it feels sad. It, it, it's dehumanizing for, you know, and that, that's really what it is for me. Yeah. That's a, that's good answer. Good answer. <laughs> Thank you. It's true. No, I, I, I think that's great. And that's the problem when I feel disenfranchised from some, okay, I'm just going to name a name here. I just watched black Adam on streaming and it's a soulless movie. Like there's, mm-hmm. I feel like there's nothing to connect me to it. The Rock, with Dwayne Johnson, is just like this dour, grim. Like there's no characterization there. He is mm-hmm. just going through the motions. And I think his costume is CGI too. So it's really just his face that we're connecting with, and mm-hmm. he gives us nothing. And it just feels like this soulless thing. And I think of all the people that worked on that movie and the thousands of people that it employed. And, you know, it's awesome. We have this movie infrastructure that, I mean, there's craft services, right? There's uh, like thousands and thousands of people that worked on this movie. And then here it comes out and it's just like, eh, people are like, hey, what's for dinner, right? Mm-hmm. And I know you're you're connected to a different side of that and you're trying your best to make movies or documentaries or produce things that feel approachable, that people can have a connection with. You're telling the stories of people and uh, to to label that as content is kind of a slap. It's not kind of, it is a slap in the face. So mm-hmm. I understand where you're coming from. Do you think, let me just think how to couch this question. Please. I mean, this is how it is now, right? I mean, is, there, is, is there hope for movies not being viewed as content? I mean, we want... I guess the I guess the question is what's the best foot forward here to get back to what we need from our independent filmmakers? Well, see, I, I feel like there's always a pushback, and I don't know how long this is going to take. There are distributors, there are studios that still treat movies as movies. You know, they're smaller, they're not universal, they're not Warner Brothers. I mean, I, I would lean into like Neon, you know, as a distributor that's you know, because the core of Neon is draft draft house films, and those guys were in it for the love of movies. You know, I feel like A24 was that way. I feel like there's a there's a there's a situation with growth 
that happens that you start to focus so much on growth that you have to sort of become part of the machine. And I'm fearing that that's kind of what's happening over with a 24 a little bit. I don't know. I don't talk to those guys. So I don't, it just feels like it when you look at the movies they are starting to put out now. I agree. Yeah. Um, but I, I do think <clears throat> that you're going to see more grassroots studios pop out of uh, filmmakers like me that are just sick of the way movies are being treated. And you still have a, a pretty, um, strong people don't know it people that aren't part of it don't know it but there's a really strong independent art house film circuit across this country there's a lot of other ways to do to do filmmaking other than just through the the traditional machine and i think these strikes and things that are going on are going to start to bring more attention to that you are a physical media guy i know you do you know you have we see it over your shoulder but i also mm-hmm. know that streaming is for an independent filmmaker streaming is a huge piece of the distribution pie for you would you just give me your thoughts on streaming and the, but maybe the place of physical media and the place of streaming for a creator so it's so funny when you talk to people and they find out what you do they're they're like oh gosh it's got to be so much easier for you guys to make it now because of streaming and it's actually not true it's actually not true it is easier to get your movie out there but it is much more difficult to actually Uh, make a survivable income Mm -hmm. with streaming because you take a company like Netflix, they want to buy your movie. They'll give you a few bucks for it, but then they want it forever, you know? And if they choose to do um, a Disney plus or or Warner brothers and pull it off, they still have it. So it's stuck on a shelf somewhere invisible to the world. Um, Then there's other options like Tubi. Tubi, I think is the most interesting of them out there right now in a weird way but you don't make money off of Tubi as a filmmaker. It's really, really difficult. So I feel like my personal experience with Family of Fear in particular, I have made more money off the physical media release of that movie than anything else. Wow. 100%, 100%. Um, Because it's weird, but you see this, this sort of traditional method of creating, releasing a movie and then pulling profit from it is still cleaner and easier and more profitable than streaming. You know, you, you look at Netflix's uh, are not necessarily just Netflix. I think all of the streaming services, they kind of hide what their actual uh, profits are behind this magical wall of how many people actually watch the movie. Yeah, and they won't and, tell the creators how it did. They won't even, they'll say we're happy they do not. or something like that. Yeah, I made a deal <laughs> with my current distributor for Family of Fear. It is on Tubi right now. I don't know how many times it's been watched. We have a quarterly meeting and discuss it and, you know, haggle it out or whatever, but they don't send me regular reports on who's watching, when they're watching, all that stuff. But Tubi is different because it's ad based. So they could, if they were more open, they could because they're making money from ads. Now it's different with streaming because they don't make a dollar amount every time a movie is streamed. It's an assumed value of this movie brought in so many subscribers or held on to so many subscribers. It there There is a, a, a cap to what a, a streaming company can make. They're only ever going to get so many subscribers. And I think you're seeing this with Netflix right now. They, I think they have just about felt that they've just about hit the wall as far as how many subscribers they can get. So they're trying to find other ways to make money now. And one of those is with what happened this week where we finally got the got the uh, emails rolling out into the United States where you can't share your password anymore, you know? Yeah. So they're trying to figure that out because when you look at, at um, streaming, like streaming versus network TV, you know, I just did a whole thing about this and uh, CBS in 2022 had 70 programs total for the entire year. The vast majority of those were sporting events and live events, like award shows and stuff like that. Maybe, maybe 15, 20 dramas and comedies that they actually produced. And they made $3.2 billion compared to Netflix in, in that same year. Made, Netflix made $32 billion, but they over half of their catalog, which is something like 6,000 titles now, is produced by Netflix, either bought from you know foreign studios or actual produced content because they have to continue churning stuff out to keep that value there for people to pay that $20 a month to stay, you know, a part of their service where CBS it's just free yeah to us so it's it's the the whole the whole system is flawed 
And because of that, they're trying to take money from the filmmakers if they can do it. They don't want to pay writers, you know, which is the big thing right now. Mm-hmm. They want to get stuff cheap and they want to hold on to it forever so they can pull it off, you know, do the old Disney trick, you know, the diamond editions. Let's pull it off the market for a while. Right. Let people forget about it and put it back out. It's almost like new content again, you know. And it just doesn't work. It doesn't work for filmmakers whatsoever. It's terrible. It's, it's, it's that's the business side of things. That's the pro big business side of things. And they, they, this is why I say like, it's the art and the commerce and they are forever in opposition to each other because they have two different goals. It's the goal of an artist. You want to make your money back on a film, but your goal is not like, I got to make as much money as I can. You want to make enough money to go do another story. You want to tell mm-hmm. them like, you know, you're in the service of storytelling. Whereas a, you know, the the stereotypical fat cat business guy with a cigar in the boardroom, like his goal is to make as much money as possible for the shareholders, for the company or whatever. It's two different goals, but they need each other for, mm-hmm. to, for distribution and for, you know, it's interesting to me because Disney, well, we should say this too, uh, as we're recording this, the news has just come out in the last 24 hours or so. Max, HBO Max got rebranded as Max and there was a credits. They're calling it a mistake. Do you see this news where the credits? Yeah. And, uh, and I don't buy the press release no, whatsoever. No way. Uh-uh. Go ahead. Uh, explain what. No. What, you, you, what, you oh, tell- okay. So here's what I was going to say about that. So essentially what happened is instead of having traditional credits that say directed by, starring, written by, all that stuff, they just had a section of created by. There's no way that that was, oh, this was created and released as a new category accidentally. Right. Now, I don't know what the thinking was on that. I tell you what it feels like. It's funny that this happened during a writer's strike. I feel like this is HBO's statement. You know, we have AI, we have all these other opportunities. We don't necessarily have to have you. That's what I feel like that says. Whether that's what they meant to say or not, it's what it feels like as a creator. It's It's like you're devaluing what we do. When I made that video that I used to tell people, I'm I, so I made this video on YouTube, uh, just a few days ago, you know, like maybe four or five days ago about the streaming, pending streaming apocalypse, the state of AI, just things that I'm concerned about that are happening mm-hmm. as business overtakes um, creativity, essentially. And I got so many comments, you know, like, man, don't worry about it. AI can't generate crap. AI can't do anything without people. I think that we are seeing evidence directly to the contrary. Some people are so unconcerned. No, so you don't want to say the sky is falling, but I say... Pack an umbrella, you know, don't don't assume this guy is falling, but pack an umbrella because there's this this stuff is happening. This is evidence of what we're talking about. Um, Do you you know, part of it is Disney. And you were talking about how this this idea of the vault, you know, when Disney Plus launched, they said Bob Iger said that these Disney Plus is going to have the entire Disney library. It's going to be an archive of Disney's film library and everything will be there. But then that didn't pay out, right? That didn't pan out because they're now vaulting things again. And then to the point now with uh, these shows, The World According to Jeff Goldblum and the- Which uh, is a popular show. People like that. I like that show. I know. They must be paying. I I, I don't even know. I don't know how that gets written off. I don't know how, you know, you got this movie. uh, Was it The Great? Is it The Great and Terrible Ivan? The gorilla movie with Bryan Cranston. And so it was like, after I record this video, Bryan Cranston issues- just saying it was after I talked about it. Brian yeah. Cranston issues this statement on social media, I guess. And he's like, I worked really hard on this movie. It came out at the beginning of the pandemic. It was really heartfelt. And I'm very proud of it. This is your last chance to see it. Watch it with your family and enjoy it. I'm like, that's tragic. Because mm-hmm. essentially what I know now from talking to various people, like if, if Disney writes these movies off so they can't, so they don't have to pay tax on them, they can't do anything else with them. They can't put them on Tubi. They can't sell them to anybody else. They're gone. They're effectively... I mean, they're not, they're destroyed in the sense of they are removed from the service and they'll never come back. They can't be monetized anymore. Piracy, I mean, they'll be in circulation for people that know and are mm-hmm. willing to do that, but they've effectively destroyed movies. And people are saying to me, it's always been like that. Movies are ephemeral. They're not meant to stick around forever. But I think when we have, how many terabytes of data goes up on YouTube, like every hour, every minute, like we have the tools so this never has to happen. Exactly. As a creator, how does it feel to you the idea that someone's creation is gone? It's devastating. It's devastating. And and it's to the point where deals that I make now, I, I'm I'm working on simultaneously two projects right now. 
And one of those projects, I've done something that I don't normally like to do, which is get funding. And because you have to, you're, you become a part of a machine at that point when you get funding. You know, it really does become committee filmmaking. But part of the deal is, is I retain the rights to the movie. And I, you know, the, the companies that I've worked with in distribution in the past, it has been the same. It's always been a short buy when, you know, by window, they get it for uh, two years to five years. And then we sit down at a table and re renegotiate and decide if they want it for another five or if it comes back to me, it's important to me because I don't want my stuff to completely disappear. Yeah. You know, I have one movie that I did sell to Amazon that's gone and they still have it and it's gone. It's been gone for years. And I worked for a lot of years on that project. So I, I had to learn what it is. It's a movie called Dramatique. It is a documentary about a murder mystery dinner theater that I, I did mm -hmm. here in Nashville. Um, I worked really hard on that. And you can kind of still see it if you look really hard, but it's not, it's not the deal that we originally had. You know, it's not the, so that, that has been my reaction to that is whoever buys my stuff, I have to have an option to get it back at some point. You know, it can't be um, 20 years or something like that. I like, I like five years. I like that. Um, but yeah, it's scary. It's scary that, you know, people that say, if you say that, that films come and go, books don't come and go. You can still go buy books. You can buy books that are hundreds of years old. You can buy the Bible. It's out there. You know, why are movies disrespected as a piece of art uh, and not treated the same as, as a book or a painting? You know, it's still art or, photo uh, uh, you know, uh, photography. That stuff never goes away. Why would movies go away? It's crazy. That's a great point. What's the difference? There is no There's difference. no difference to no. me. Sorry, I get fired up. <laughs> no, you should. And, you know, I, I get fired up, too. And it's I'm glad you're fired. I mean, I think we're on the same page with this, too. I was I, people sometimes tell me I don't know what I'm talking about, but talking to you, I think I do. I think we should be concerned. I think that we need to say because if we're vigilant, you know, we are the ones that consume this stuff. We're the ones that pay for this. We're the ones that ultimately have the power by what we choose to support and to not support. And it's time we start sending these messages that, hey, no, no, that's too far. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be interested to see if Disney eventually ends up backing down on some of the stuff that they were talking about. You know, I think about Warwick Davis, right? So I've met Warwick Davis. So I've with the Willow movie and TV series now. And I think about there's no disc release for that. Disney never put it on iTunes or Apple, whatever. They never, it, there's no digital version of that. It was only on Disney plus mm -hmm. when that goes away. So his children can't watch that. He can't watch that. His family will never see that work. This is a thing he did, a thing he worked on, and it has effectively been snuffed out of existence. And that is tragic to me. And it's not that I'm like, this, like, oh, this is such an amazing series. I haven't even watched it. You know, that's not the point. The point is people created this, they worked on it, and now it's being removed. And I don't know, I don't know that I want to go as far as to say this is like book burning. That maybe is a little bit too far, but it kind of feels like that to me. It, it does feel like, like that. It, it feels totalitarian and and it's scary. Well, and you know, it's not even just that that the people that worked on it love that. For everything that's put out, there are people that love it. Now, it might not be millions and millions of people, but yeah. there's tens of thousands that watched it and liked it, you know, and those people don't get access to that piece of art anymore. And that's crazy to me, you know, uh, uh, a piece of art, a, a movie is only yours alone until you put it out into the world. Then it becomes everybody else's, which is why I've sort of had this like really love hate relationship with what's been happening with Star Wars for the last 25 years or longer because, oh, George Lucas wants to rewrite it. He didn't feel it was done. He didn't do it the way he wanted to because he can afford it, whatever. That movie was put out in the 70s and, and you gave it to people and now you've taken it. You've taken that experience that, you know, you always make me think of this because you're like, you know, the, the version of the movie I want to see is the one that came to theaters because that's what I saw the first time. It's true. That piece of art has been put out there for people, you know, so right. it belongs to everybody now. And if you do everything you can to just basically destroy it, then it is like book burning. Do you remember when so, those THX VH, uh, v, VHS tapes came out for Star Wars in the 90s and the ad was like, see them again for the first time for the last time? And I was yeah. like... <laughs> He wasn't kidding. He really he was it. not. 
He was. I not thought that kidding. it was just hyperbole, but he was not playing around. He took mm-hmm. him out of circulation. It's so crazy, right? Because you can like give it. Because yeah, you want to add. You want you want Greedo to shoot first. All right, give us the give us the second cut, right? So that's the. That's the revisionist cut, or the special edition cut, but don't remove the original cut from circulation. Exactly. Do anything you want. You created it. If anybody can change it and play with it, it should be you. But you've given something to us. Don't take it back. You well, here, we should talk about this too because he didn't do. He did that because he or he was able to do that because he was the one that had all of his. He owned it. It was his mm-hmm. to do with what he wanted to do. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a studio that did that. It was the creator that did that, and that's a controversial thing to talk about. It very much is. And and that's the flip side of it. You know, that's a whole different thing. I, I believe in trying to maintain ownership of, of my work, um, not because I, I want to go back and change it, but because I want to make sure it can live mm-hmm. at, at this point. But he may, wanted to maintain ownership so that he could play with it and tweak it and change it and do whatever he wanted to with it. And yeah. that to me, that's and, and like you said, it's it's great to do that. I like to see director's cuts. I like when, because uh, film is, uh, you know, like I said, a, a committee uh, piece of art. When a director can go back and really play with something and do what they wanted to do, that's great. But I guess don't take, don't take what you gave us initially away. And, yeah. and he did. So that's, I have a hard feeling about that. And I don't think we will ever see those original cuts of Star Wars, the Star Wars movies again. If we do, it won't be till after he passes. Yeah. You know, that's, I think that's what everybody's waiting on is this. When I say everybody, I mean, Disney, I think that's what they're waiting for him to go so that they can just do what they want to do without getting, without the grief. I did, this is a whole sidebar. And I might even cut this out of our final conversation. Yeah. But have you read Bob Iger's account of the whole Star Wars purchase situation? And I have not. Went? man it is crazy if you want evidence like so many people love bob Iger, like he's their grandpa or something like he's an evil man mm-hmm. he's a terrible human being he's not even a good businessman because he burns bridges mm-hmm. so i'm gonna i'll give you the cliff's notes version and uh maybe i will leave this in i don't know so he, that he goes to george you know he's talking to george lucas he's like we really want we're the home for star wars like he makes him feel comfortable trusting them george was going to make the, the prequel the uh sequel trilogy himself and then like the land deal where he wanted to build the studios for it kind of fell through which is funny because he ended up donating that land for public housing so he was like well i'll show you so what he was going to build the studio they were like we don't want a studio in our community he's like okay it's public housing now um so he didn't make the movies he sells it to disney and then he thinks that they are buying his ideas for the sequel trilogy and all the characters and him as well like he comes with part of the deal where he's guiding it and consulting and all this stuff and then um, it gets to the point that they're going to meet for it's going to be him. It's going to be George Lucas, Kathleen Kennedy and Bob Iger and J.J. Abrams in a meeting to break the story. And so George Lucas comes in and everybody else is there and they're like, we've actually already got it figured out. But thank you. And he's like, oh, so we're doing the ideas from my scripts. And I know we're going to go in a different direction. And basically they have outed him. And he was furious and it was totally, totally blindsided him. And Bob Iger's like, of course, I felt bad about it, but that's what I had to do because there's no way we could have George Lucas creating new Star Wars with a reputation that the prequel trilogy has, but we couldn't tell him that. And I'm like, what a terrible bait and switch you pulled on George Lucas. Like you wanted Mm -hmm. his creation and then you cut him out of the process. It sounds to me like George Lucas was a little too trusting, too. He should have had yeah. a multitude of lawyers reading every word if he wanted to be yeah. continue to be involved. I mean, because, you know, Disney's a big corporation. Regardless of what you think about each individual person within that, it's still a big corporation. And like you said, they got that big stogie and they're trying to make the dollars and whatever they think is the best way to do that, that's what they're going to do. Um, and, and as far as Iger goes, my thing about Bob Iger is compared to Chapek. They're both bad, but Chapek was so short-sighted when it came to movies mm-hmm. and, and the impact of physical media and all the other things. He was, he was self-destructing the company in a lot of ways. You know, what yeah. he did with Disney Plus and all that stuff, craziness, craziness. So this I'm, is a whole string of bad decisions going back. Mm-hmm. I, and I, it's, it's, uh, 
it's scary. It's just, it's honestly scary. And now that's one of the reasons that we're in the position we're in and we're having this conversation is because Disney is this Titan in the entertainment industry and they are, they are removing art from existence. It's effectively. Mm -hmm. Well, and they're getting a lot of attention for it and you hit the nail on the head with why they're doing it. It literally is about tax breaks. It literally is that, uh, you know, a lot of people tried to defend it. Oh, you know, it's, it takes a lot of bandwidth to be streaming and make these, this many movies and shows available for, um, look at YouTube. Like you said, it doesn't really, it, it takes management, but they can do it. It's literally about what they're valuing Disney plus at and what they have to pay taxes on. HBO did it last year, you know, and people got upset then too, but it kind of just passed. Um, people are more upset, I guess, about the Disney, but uh, let's see how long people stay fired up about it. It's, it's, you know, mm -hmm. people like, like you said, don't take it seriously enough. You know, it's going to have to hit home for some people. I tell people now, if you don't want to be a physical media collector, that's great. It's not for everybody. I don't collect books really. I like audio books because it's just works better for me. Yeah. Um, but you should have, let's say your top 20 films, you should have those on physical because you might not be able to see them Absolutely. at some point there or no you're going to have to you're going to have to streaming hop from streamer to streamer to keep up with them and that's yeah. stupid yeah that's well said no substitute for physical media um and that's not a i, I people i i am not only physical media i want to make that very clear i stream a lot i watch a lot of streaming series mm -hmm. but it's not a substitute for ownership there is no substitute for owning the things that you care about yep and, and I do the same thing. And if it's something that I watch streaming that I really like and it is on physical, I seek it out. I seek yeah, it out. It's just because I, I, I mean, if you liked Willow, it's going away and you don't have a choice, you know? So, yeah. Yep. What's our what's our path out of this conversation? What's the how do we how do we exit here? Like, what's the future? What's the is there any hope? Is there any optimism? I mean, <sighs> So I think on top of the way, well, it's interesting. You know, I don't know if you saw the uh, press release about Max yesterday, uh, outside of what we talked about as far as the credits go, but at the end of their press release, they were talking about how Discovery Plus and, and HBO were, were being bundled. And what I thought was interesting that stuck out to me as someone who's been in this for a long time, you too, is at the end it said bundling is the future of streaming this sounds like cable tv from the late 80s to me yeah you know we're going back to a situation where um these guys are learning they can't make it on their own so we're gonna have packages we've got disney plus hulu and espn now we've got hbo max and discovery plus you know now we've got uh what is it paramount plus and showtime it's turning into cable TV. The only difference is now, it, well, there really isn't a difference, you know, because we paid for basic cable and they also pushed ads to us. Now we're going to pay for basic streaming plans and they're going to push ads to us. It's, it's really coming around to be the same thing over again. And I, I honestly, I, I was a big proponent uh, in my younger days uh, of, of, splitting it all up because I didn't want to pay for all that extra stuff. Yeah. But it's one of those things you learn. It's, it's naive because all that extra stuff can't survive on its own. And all the good stuff needs more value add to keep us engaged. So this is just how it's going to go. Yeah. And I feel like we're on our way back to that same old situation. It's just fed to us across the internet instead of by a satellite or whatever. So I, I feel like 10 years from now, it's going to look just like cable did in, in the nineties. And I don't mind ads, to be honest with you. That's a perfect time for me to check my TikToks or go to the bathroom. So I, I'm fine with ads coming back. Um, uh, I think the more interesting thing from the creator side is how AI is going to impact what we do. And uh, I don't know if you want to diverge into that conversation. Do Let's do it. Yeah. Okay. Do you think it's a threat? I, I I do think in the beginning it's a threat, but it's it's interesting because it also reminds me of a, of a different time. It reminds me of the advent of prosumer digital cameras. 
I'll never forget hearing so many um, old school filmmakers say, oh, no, this is terrible. It's terrible that this is coming into what we do because now anybody can make a movie. And I'm sitting here in the background going, yes, anybody can make a movie. Just because you because you could do it doesn't mean it's going to be good. Right. And it eventually worked itself out, you know. Um, and now this whole idea of AI, you can go in if you're really good at prompting. I guarantee you that's going to become a meme and it's going to be a, a Gen Z term. You know, how's your prompt game? Stuff like that. That's going to be a thing in, because AI is going to start impacting everything. If you re- I've been practicing with it a little bit just to see because I, I do copywriting. That's part of how I pay the bills between movies. So it's a big concern for me, you know. But if you are good at writing prompts, you can really get stuff out of it that's scary. You know, I, I did some some work with a script idea and then sent it over to my co-producer. I said, what do you think of this? He's like, when did you write this? This is awesome. I'm like, oh, crap. I, you know, it took me 15 minutes, you know, to do it. So it, it is scary. I, you know, and I see some writers I know with the writer strike, there's a lot of, uh, of stuff in their demands about how they don't want to be um, given AI developed scripts and and be asked to to ghostwrite them or clean them up or whatever. I think it's going to happen because the problem with AI right now is you could you could say, I'm going to go write a script and you could use AI to do that. And no one would know would know at this point yeah, that, that you used AI. So trying to put that back in the box is not going to work. You know, I've seen some studios already saying it's not going to happen. We are using AI now as a as a tool. I really like it because I like to write when I'm doing short films or or whatever. I like to write in treatment form. I don't like all the formatting, all the blah, blah, blah of script writing. I hate it. I like to get my idea in a treatment to be able to take that treatment, drop it into AI and have it spit me back out a script. I'm going to use that. I'm going to do that because I hate that step. I always try to find people that are willing to do that part for me because I hate it. But it, it it's wonderful as a tool in that way. But like we were talking about how I feel like storytelling is part of what makes us human. If you try to push, because there's going to be studios that are going to try and push writers completely out and just do it with AI. You know, a producer with a good prompt game can go in and, and do it. I, I, it. Again, it's another dehumanizing part of, of the industry. Yeah. But I do think it probably will settle out. We'll find a way because you've got to be a creative person to begin with, to even use AI in a way that works. And I feel like we'll find our space with it, but right now it's going to get overused Mm -hmm. just like CGI got overused when it first happened. Um, How many movies do you remember from around 2000 that had the old getting hit by a bus bit in it do you remember that's the one that else always a pet peeve somebody's walking into the street they get hit by a bus i'm like that must have been like the bus hitting program that you bought off the shelf for mm-hmm. 39.99 i don't know it's in i feel so like final movies. destination did that and then everybody did that yeah. it's like oh god yeah so it, it it is that like i saw um i saw fast x the other day and what's what's fascinating to me is the cgi is not getting better it's actually getting worse and it's because they're they're it's back to the whole content discussion. They're churning it out, you know. They're not spending like I feel like you can look at the first Iron Man, and look at the most recent Marvel movie, and the CGI is actually worse than that movie because more time was spent on it, and they integrated, you know, like like the Iron Man suit. I think from from chest up was real, from chest down was maybe where the CGI was, and blending those two really works. But now they just want to do it all in CGI and not worry about it. And you could just tell, and it looks bad. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think AI is going to be something that's really, really overused. I think it needs to be regulated. I would rather it be regulated within the industry than try and have it banned and then have the industry use it anyway, which is what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. We just have to find that that footing with it. And, and, and uh, as creators, we've got to drop our ego a little bit too. It, uh, you know, as a writer, if, if a producer... And there's some producers out there that really have a vision. They're just not the writer or the director. You know, they have, oh, I have this really great idea. What they would have normally done is gone to a writer with that idea. Well, now they're likely to go to AI, develop something with AI, and then go to a writer. You've got to be the writer that says, you know, 
I'm better than AI. I have a voice, you know, give me this and I'll make it, I'll make it good. That's, I think that's a lot of what's going to happen in the future. And I, and, and I, I had, I, I still have, I still have problems with, that. I still have, my emotions are in the way, but right. I know it's what's happening and I know it's just how it's going to be, you know? It's almost a Star Trek kind of a quandary because we are faced with, you know, I think about all those episodes of Star Trek where Kirk would walk into a situation and he'd go like, but it is the struggle that makes you human. <laughs> and now we're at a point where like, we're Kirk, right? We're like, but it's the struggle. Like it's the mistakes that make us who we are. And like, we're facing all these AI, th these things that aren't human. And I don't know that they can pretend to be human. So maybe that's the thing that humans are able to bring to it is that sense of vulnerability and the imperfection and mm -hmm. the surprise, the sense of surprise, too. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, you know, I, I think if T if Takeshi Miike, for example, were starting now, instead of doing 10 Yakuza movies just to do his one, like, passion piece, he would do 10 AI-written movies and then do the one that he wrote. You know, that's just how it works. You know, I'll do 10 of these if you fund my whatever. You know, and I think that's still going to happen. I think that's still the way, to, way it works is if you write something cool and it's great, people are not going to care where it comes from. Yeah. you know so you just well, got to be that's, good that's true too is like these are concerns for you and me because of who we are and what we've grown up with but the people that are entering into their fandom who are maybe 12 years old right now they won't care about where this stuff came from they just know they like it you know exactly Music and the problem is it's it. it's so packaged now like every yeah. marvel like i was a marvel fan for the first phase sure. but now it's just repeating the same story over and over again now essentially but kids don't care young people don't right. care you know so i don't know what to do about that yeah maybe it's not our problem i don't know but we sure have opinions and we, have we sure do them. we sure yeah. do uh where is so you still selling physical copies of family of fear where can people get that yeah so you can get it on amazon it is technically available through pretty much anybody that sells physical media online it's not in stores you've got to order it i think the the easiest place to get it is is um obviously Amazon. There are some other places that you can watch it digitally that I recommend. You can see it on Tubi. It's free. But if you're going to watch it digitally and you want to support me, watch it on Canopy. Um, it's not going to cost you anything anyway. And that's an educational tool that people don't often know that there's thousands and thousands of movies out there you can just go watch. And uh, Canopy actually does support their creators. You know, the educational uh side of things for family of fear has been much more beneficial for us than anything streaming but yeah get that get that dvd it family, family of fear has surprised me it has a real sort of evergreen life it kind of comes up again every year around halloween as something that we can push and i think there may be a new physical version of it later this year. That's all I'll say. There might be something better coming. Yeah. Keep me in the loop, okay? Keep yeah. me in the loop. Let's just say if you like HD, you may want to wait. And I'm costing myself money by saying that. But I want people to have it. I shot the movie and mastered it in 4K. I would love for you to at least see it at 1080p. Oh, man. So right. there is something something bubbling you know, for this Halloween season. So it's pretty cool. Cool. You still tight with those guys? You still keep in touch with the, uh, the actual location? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, uh, it, it's a joke within my production team is every time we do a documentary, uh, one of my uh, grips is always like, well, I can't wait to see what new friends we have after this one. I tend to like stick around, you know, with yeah. people. I, I, you know, it's just me. That's so great. yeah, I, I do talk to them all the time. Well, what else is, can you tell us anything that you're working on or what might be in the pipeline? I, I have a couple of projects. It's a little early to to be speaking okay. on them but I, what i would say is just follow my social media i'll put stuff out there as soon as i can but i have TikTok, uh youtube and letterbox are really my my platforms of choice and they're all ots movies now so to try to make it easier gotcha yeah well is there anything else you want to cover before we wrap it up we covered a lot of ground here. yeah we really did i probably talked your head off but uh i'm yeah. good unless you have anything else you want to talk about you just got me fired up that video the other day. I'm like, man, I have not talked to Heath in forever, and he is really hitting the nail on the head, and no one else is talking about this, so I had to contact you. I'm glad that you did. This was a great conversation. It was everything that I hoped it would be and more, so thank you, Stephen. Um, I admire you. I admire your work. I admire your integrity, and the fact that you would walk out of a meeting when someone says content, it impresses me. That's that's We need people like that, so thank you, uh, and uh, all the best to you. 
Thanks. There's so much to think about and unpack from this conversation. Ultimately, I think that we just need to be vigilant and be aware of what's happening, be mindful of what's happening. I'm not calling for any boycotts. You know, there's no, Twitter feuds don't solve any problems. Money, you know, money's really the only thing that walks. And if we don't, if, if we see movies being created that reduce the human element or that diminish the creator's input, we can vote with our wallets. And maybe that's what we should do. Just vigilance and being aware of what's happening, I think, goes a long way. This is a conversation we're going to continue to have and to unpack as it unfolds here. Because I think we're just at the beginning of it, unfortunately. But uh, please do follow Stephen. He's such a thoughtful guy, a thoughtful creator who has a really unique voice. You know, we need so much of creation now is being homogenized by executives and by, you know, corporations and notes. And it's all just being leveled into just the dull roar, you know, it just becomes part of the noise. But when you talk to a filmmaker like Stephen, who has a voice, who has things he wants to say, we gotta support that. So I know you feel the same way. Again, links in the description of this, so you can find uh, find Stephen where in, in all of his outlets. Let's continue the conversation in the various places. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can please give us a thumbs up. Please subscribe. Please comment to keep this conversation going. If you're listening to the audio version, you can rate, you can review, you can subscribe. These are all things you can do to support Serial at Midnight. More importantly, support meaningful conversations like this. I appreciate you guys. I appreciate Steven. Let's keep these conversations going. Until next time, I will catch you later.